very difficult situation because the last protest is continuously giving a lecture. And this day, it is not so easy. But in spite of that, whatever that is wrong. Blood is here. No. Which is generally. Don't ever think of age. Think of yourself. Okay? Never. But Never. that kind of the spirit I did not observe anything. coming back to fly ash in polymer all right and this work is fly ash polypropylene composites so students have worked in poly, polypropylene polyethylene then pva and also epoxy so those are the useful range of polymers and we could see that we can actually we can put fly ash any, anywhere, but with proper modification. So when Napan, but then he came and did another PhD, so he, he did his second PhD, double PhD, okay, with me. So it was good to have him then, because he already had experience from Japan, and Japan is very good. Japan is very good, so. So these, <coughs> these things were done, so I have kept those slides as they were presented in, in Woka because at that time I was not good in with all this computer and PowerPoint things like that and it's interesting I had a student, female student who went from India and I think it was, she was from Punjab and her husband was also a very computer specialist so I said okay can you do these PowerPoint slides for presenting there and then I said, yes, your husband is there, so please do that, and we'll pay him on an hourly basis to do the things. So that is fair. So I think quality of slides are good, and it is totally different from what we have been talking about, flies in ceramics, the last couple of days. Now, fly ash in polymers. So fly ash is, is like a reinforcing agent, so we're not talking much about fly ash properties, but still, when you have to do, when you have to do composites and when you have to put these reinforcements there, you actually have to characterize them. So that's why you will find X-ray and all the things. And this, Dr. Devnath had a chemistry background, so it was nice of me to have him, so that he, he could do FTIR, Raman and all the other things. And he's the one who would never accept no. And I said, that's very good. OK? All right. So his name is, in all publications of my students, the students, the scholar's name comes number one. So, so his name is there. But because I'm a, that's his name, Dev, Dilipnath. No? His name, his surname is Devnath, but he called himself Nath, Dilipnath. I said, that's fine. And Professor I Bing Yu, he's a great man, he's from China and he actually worked in modeling, he had set up a modeling center in, in our school and then he did a lot of work but then Monash University stole him from our school. He said Monash University said, Dr. I Bing, let's come here and then he's setting up a lot of Australia, China things. 
but it was nice to have him there. All right. So I've kept all the other things. And the two other names, Daryl Blackburn and Chris White, they are from Cement Australia in the in the in that project. Dr. Chris White, he was a scientist, engineer, and Daryl Blackburn, he was half engineer and half management. But I wanted to make sure that their names are also included. So whenever we had something, they were in Brisbane, so about thousand kilometers from Sydney, but they used to come whenever we had some research thing. So it was nice to have them. All right. So this is a teamwork between academia and industry. All right. And I would request the same thing to all future scholars. If you have any involvement with industry in your publications. Did you listen to all the things which I said or do I have to repeat? Okay. So with their permission, the Chris White and the black man, so we, we had their names as co-authors, okay? Because that's a part of the team all. See, can you hear me? So let's sing the national anthem of flyers. Flyers, flyers, flyers from coal power station. People call it a waste material. I don't like that notion. So sing again. Flyers, flyers, flyers from coal power station. Everyone, if someone is not singing. Flyers, flyers, flyers from coal power station. People call it a waste material. I don't like that notion. All right? Flyers, a valuable source of ceramics fine and coarse. You can have it in the micron size or a nanometer, a mill down price. Flyers. All right? Okay, thank you. you sorry, if I just will give you the words to, tomorrow later. Doctor, he, a scientist, he has come from Saudi Arabia. Is my former student, Dr. Selvin Thomas. He is now a professor there. Dr. Selvin Thomas suggested him to come. And his university approved him. But Saudi Arabia is far away, so it, it took a bit of time to come. Any question? Okay. The structure property correlation and molecular dynamics of fly ash polymer composites. So now we are coming from structure and property, and then we are going down to the much final level of interaction that is molecular dynamics. Engineers, we often don't think of molecules, we think of the structure, but chemists, chemists and physicists, they said if there are no molecules, there would be no structures. All right? So I was Happy to see that Dr. Dilip Devnath, he used his chemistry background. And so this is the combination of the structure property and also the molecular dynamics. So some of the things have gone into quite in depth in the molecular dynamics. So I leave those to the, our chemistry specialists, all right? There are also chemistry specialists on this side and that side. Outline of the study, introduction, aim of the study, characterization of fly ash, and results and discussion of composition on mechanical properties, morphological behavior, crystallization kinetics, and then put composites with modified fly ash and polymer. When we say modified fly ash means you put a little bit of coating on fly ash. I was when Dr. Lahiri was giving, came to give his presentation yesterday. I was not there for all the time because I was sitting in the back chair and I couldn't listen to the voice. He didn't use the microphone, so I, I spent some time. But what Professor Kamalkar said that was interesting, he said for bomb applications, you put plastics just like that, something like that, the body does not recommend it. Uh, or the body does not recognize it. So to make it a part of the body, he said, the 
they put carbon coating. So that was interesting. So that was something which I also learned, all right, from both of them. Now, the same thing, when you give a coating on polymers, when you are uh, flyers in putting it in the matrix, that can so make, make a difference. Because if you put a coating, then the matrix thinks, oh, this is, this is part of my family, or this is part of my structure. But sometimes that may have a undesired effect in some other areas. So it's best to try both without coating and without, with coating. So without coating makes it easier, less steps, because if you're going to make something and then your boss or manager say, coating, that means we have to set up another plan. Okay? So it may have to go through the management and everything and everything. Yes. So both the things are important. And you have to think about it. And never think that, oh, this will not work. Try to see whether it works. So this worked because that coating was done. And also, I must acknowledge, we had a, a PhD scholar from IIT Kharagpur who went there. His supervisor's name was Professor A.K. Bantia, Ajit Kumar Bantia. He was in material science, but he was a polymer scientist. And the name of the student, he is now also in Middle East, he is a professor. His name is Dr. Arfat Anis. So he went and did, did work. So it was nice having from background, and Professor A.K. Bantia, Ajit Kumar Bantia, he lives in Calcutta. He is originally from Rajasthan. So you have northeast everything together, it's like a, so he, he, he is a Rajasthani with a coating of Bengali, okay? So then you can make a composite and things like that. India is excellent, so is Australia and so is the, the world, all right? I always find so much nice things in everyone. And thank you for coming from Saudi Arabia. I've never been to Saudi Arabia, but it's good that you came here, all right? Thank you. So Saudi Arabia has come here, so that's excellent. Give a hand for you. And say hello to my scholar, Professor uh, Selvin Thomas. Okay. And then, Dr. Dilip Devnath, he never stopped at anything, and that's what I liked him, except when I said, so from his thesis, I'll go later. He kept on publishing papers and I was happy I, I used and So I, I had to give more and more time with, with him. And that was very good. But then when he had over 10 or 12 papers, a German, a German company, those things were published, and a German company said, hang on, can we include all these in a book. So his thesis became part of a book published by a journal company. So I think we will give you that detail. So it was very nice. So that will be very, very good. Fly as now all the things which you have done last couple of days. It's a summary. It can be used in agriculture, cement, concrete, and also polymer composites. And when we talk about polymer composites, we can use in polyethylene, polypropylene, polyester, epoxy, and other polymer. Polyester can be both thermoplastic, can be thermosetting, and polyester is much cheaper. You know, you have polyester, epoxy, and then polyester is very cheap, epoxy is very expensive, and so people also came up with another polymer in between vinyl ester. So these are the things which can be done. Polyethylene is a thermoplastic. Polypropylene is also a thermoplastic, but polypropylene has more strength and stiffness. So, and these are the polymer flash composites, some reference. So this is how people make, make them, and they can make components from there. 
and the reference is given here. It's not our work because they live started working with me around 2009, 2008 or 9, something like that. We had a, but this is what he has, he gave as an example of an earlier work. Now, properties of polyester and fly ash composites, what people have found that if you put tens, uh, more and more fly ash in, again this is not his work, when you put more and more fly ash, the strength can go down. And the reason for that is when you put something as I was saying yesterday, if there is, if there are some discontinuity, so if it is a spherical particles and you have discontinuity and that gives a stress concentration of 3. So, which means if you have we, without any fly ash, if the strength, strength is 52 and when you put 20 percent, if it is 28, that means you may have something, part of that there is stress concentration there and that is reducing the strength, all right. Then there is another example, put fly ash and this is probably the polyethylene fly ash composites and again the tensile strength tends to go down. So, this is sometimes people get worried, but this is if you look from fracture mechanics point of view and tomorrow I will give lectures some tutorials in fracture mechanics. So, this is not a not too big a big issue. It is when you are doing the tensile strength, you are pulling it and the voids are there. So, the stress concentration is acting there. So, that is why the strength is going down because it is failing earlier. What is tensile strength? As Dr. Kamalkar, he showed you the other day, tensile strength is when you go to the top at the point when it yields or sometimes you, you can take when it goes from linearity to, to non-linearity, you can take at that point. So, those are test measures only and that is a unidirectional test. So, very seldom things happen. So, when you have concrete, tensile strength does not really matter. Most of the time, compressive stress or shear, that kind of thing. But these are standard test methods, so you have to go through that. Properties of polypropylene, fly ash composites. Again, if you have put fly ash, it's about very slow things. So, these things are what people can see. Now, objectives of this study, which Dr. Dilip Devnath did, what he did, he wanted to see the utilization of fly ash in composite based products with enriched mechanical properties. So, what, what this work did that the, whereas the published literature showed oh yeah, Suprabhat, oh yeah. हम जब भारत में आते हैं हम पूरा अंग्रेजी बोल जाते हैं और आज मेरा हिंदी थोड़ा ज्यादा अच्छा होना चाहिए ना लेकिन बनारस से हिंदी काफी अच्छा है सो नाउ व्हाट द ऑब्जेक्टिव ऑफ द स्टडी वाज दिस इज नाउ अ रिसर्च ओके रिसर्च पार्ट व्हिच वाज डन for you, Dr. Abdullah, yesterday and day before, we had covered fly ash, cement, concrete and all those things and those, all those slides are there. So, you can contact Professor Kamalkar and you can get the PDF versions of the things like that, all right? Yes. The strategy is to improve or develop products using fly ash, but resulting uh, aim is to have enriched mechanical properties. So, new experimental conditions, 
screening of polymers that means you can select the plastics which will give better things then addition of additives and addis modification of flyers that means if you need to give a coating on the flyers mechanics study included mechanical and morphological studies and also crystallization kinetics now if you are if you are using polypropylene is polypropylene amorphous or crystalline material is crystalline or semi crystalline when when you talk about polymer when you say crystalline it's actually semi crystalline all right okay and then the calculation of interfacial interaction parameters based on results and molecular dynamic simulation of interactive crystalline planes the materials were fly ash from gladstone power station brisbane which is in queensland brisbane is a, is a brisbane is the capital of the state queensland and the polypropylene was of, obtained from standard shops or the suppliers okay so this are the fly ash particles and this is this is the fly ash in a container like you you remember yesterday professor call brought fly ash in a container so here the color is slightly different but it's all right sample preparation injection molding was done at 210 degrees c are you familiar with injection molding or okay and i understand that in the afternoon professor call is doing some labs he is taking you some labs has he have you done any lab so far okay but please remind him then because in your program labs are so at least if you can go and have a look at this injection molding and or compression molding things it will give you an idea all right so please remind him if you remind him then he will do it once he does something he does 110% Okay, but he has so many busy things. Please remind him because it's a part, you know, in that program. You say in the afternoon there are labs and things. I suggested some lab testing, and then he said to me, "Dr. Bondubad, then leave it to me. He will do it." So he'll do it. He's excellent. And there are two tests which you done. This is a tensile test, STM D six thirty eight. This for all plastics. and this is actually a impact not stem impact all right but then what we also did we put in the notch impact we put a little bit of crack there and then we we there so we both with the notch and also with a sharp crack in between But because that i my phd was on that basis when i had done so you had notch things but my supervisor told me when i did phd i had no idea about fracture mechanics that put a sharp razor cut without much of stress just slowly and then it gives a totally different properties okay and that is actually the realistic things that's what when cracks happen in materials so notch is what is the notch tip radius anyone remembers in sharpie your impact what is the notch tip radius when that v thing there yes how much i've said 2 to 3 mm how much you will say so you are almost correct but you are 10 times more this is about is 0.25 mm please remember that so 0.25 mm that means it's still not a sharp crack okay so that's good for impact impact tests are like that but if you want to look at the fracture properties you just put a sharp crack and it gives you the k1c g1c and this work this also i found it was done in usa and uk particularly uk 
they did in Imperial College, Professor J. G. Williams, John Gordon Williams. So he, he is very famous. And then when I I went to Cambridge to present, Cambridge University to present my some of my uh, PhD lecture. And then he invited to me to give a seminar in his department. I said, sir, are you sure? I was very surprised because he is such a famous. I said, you mean seminar or do you want me to sit down and listen to the No, you have to come and give a seminar. All right, that's it. So, so I, my work was presented in Cambridge University, then uh, his, his university and things like that. And that's why I came to know London a bit more. And when I had some free time, I used to work in Trafalgar Square. And you know, when I was in, used to work in Trafalgar Square, there were all birds in this. They, they were, they used to, they were flying and in the Trafalgar Square and they're coming and eating and things like that. Like all the birds, they come in IT, Kanpur and everywhere. So, so there's a big similarity worldwide, all right? And then I, sometimes I used to go and used to take a look at the Buckingham Palace. And there were lots of guards there, so I couldn't get in there. But I was to say hello to them, all right. But it was Professor J. G. William and his group who initiated the idea of introducing a sharp crack, a razor blade crack at the tip of the notch, and then it, it could become a fracture mechanics criterion, all right. Okay. Particle diameter. So this is characterization of fly ash, volume percent and things like that. Particle diameter, if the particle diameter goes up, then volume percent goes up or come down like that. So th these are two different models. So this is what those methods were used. And concentration dependence on particle size profile. So Concent there are four graphs. The concentration can vary between 0 0.51 to 0 0.76. And particle size, if it goes above a certain amount, so this is, if it goes like that, if it go, if you're going above 100 percent, the volume comes back much less. But if you are around close to 10 to 15. Remember yesterday we, we showed that there are, and also the day before, some fly ash that from Brisbane, we had taken four sets, four flyers from four different uh, coal power stations. One had more than 100. So if you have that more than 100, then the volume percent of surface area will come down almost so low. But if you have actually the fly ash in around the 10 to 15, the other three, then volume of surface area will become much high, all right? And if you have surface area much more, that means the contraction, this uh, stress transfer will be much more, all right? Then this fly ash has much higher, higher strength than polymer, then the polymer will transfer this stress to the fly ash, and the fly ash will take it over, all right? It's like in a, in a ministry, if some di difficult things come, the ministers pass, pass it on to the chief minister or the prime minister. Yes, yes, so that, and it is important because this stress transfer has to be there and the strong, strong component has to take up the stress for the time being, so that it will not, there will not be any failure or any fracture. And that is everywhere. All right, whether metal, ceramics, polymers, or human beings everywhere. This is a wonderful picture, isn't it? And this shows you have you can have fly ash, anything, particle size different. So this is scale bar is 10 microns. So this shows fly ash where particle the particles are. Even the largest particle, this is about 9 to 10 microns. So this is, and when you do this ACM or take any photograph, always put a scale. 
never put a picture or a micrograph something without a scale and if you don't have any scale if you are if you are standing some of the if it's a large structure cement structure or things like that go and stand next to the thing i have a i know a person who works in mining engineering and she mining engineer she actually does this blasting you know so is not underground mine above ground so and she used to say that she said i said how big is the mine she didn't say anything one day she sent a picture so that was the mine and she stood in the center of the mine so when she sent the picture so she is about five and a half feet tall or little she looked like this tiny thing and that gave me yes yeah, so now i understand because normally without a scale it's not you don't know what it happened so even if you have nothing and when you are working in a company or mining or in a big structure if you have nothing like that if you don't have a six foot thing just go and stand there because some idea it will give you okay but on the other hand if you have very small particles you can see it in your own eyes how small they are even uh, optical microscopes they are much cheaper it's easy to have at least try to get some of them but a scanning electron microscope gives has a good depth of field and also this is so with the computers if you put these images in the uh, under a certain programs these images can actually give you the particle size range and distribution mm -hmm. uh, distribution particle size distribution and how much yes is distribution how much it, what percent is certain particles and things like that okay so you can see and it actually you can measure it early early days when those uh, programs are done, you have to measure it, you have to measure and count and do things like that. Now the computer says, okay, you have your cup of tea and I'll do that. So the computer does that. But it gives very nice information, okay? And particle size and particle size distribution, in one of my latest research scholars saying we find that it has some very good effect on high level dielectric properties certain particle size range of particle size gives you the highest positive dielectric constant and some or positive with the real one real and some particle size distribution gives you the highest imaginary dielectric constant so whereas the particle size but when it goes like that all in a sudden this can be valuable this can have valuable effect in this in those properties and dielectric properties are very important in energy saving capacitance and things like that okay like all the energy that comes from coal they are not always con continuously used so they they are held in the capacitance it's like a bank you put it in the bank and then when the bank opens you just can go and get your money or these days you can get those money through your credit card and all other things but that is the advantage of capacitance okay dielectric properties and fly ash can give a very good dielectric range of dielectric properties can i go to the next one and also if you see there they are all very small these particles will be about less than one one micron this tiny little because this is this is distance between these two lines are is one micron one 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 so total is 10 micron from here to there this was done at 15 kilovolts and surface area is like that okay chemical composition of fly ash analyzed by 
ICP and XRF. What is ICP AES? Can you speak loudly? Hmm? Okay, and what does it do? How does it work? All right, you can tell us later on. All right, but this is this is one technique, and also this is what is XRF. Yes, I cannot hear. I cannot hear. So please speak loud, oh my dear. Okay, speak loudly. Okay. Why? What is the advantage of using two measures? Why did this? Did, did Dr. Devnath use two methods? Because if you use one method, it's, it costs you less, less money. But the fact is that if you use two methods, and that will give you the confirmation and confidence. Confirmation is all right, but confidence is also thing. Because when you're making a presentation or where you are trying to get some money from your management, and they'll say, what is the guarantee that your this this table is correct and we we have the faith in it then you say okay if you do not trust this we come up with this one and that gives you some variation depending on the technology all right but i see e the reason why i put them in light color so that it gives you a chance to think about it extra fluorescence and in, induced coupled plasma atomic emission spectroscopy. We have this Mark and analytical center which now combines all those other features, other things. Even we had X-ray equipment and things like that in our department and school. They have all been shifted to that center. So electron microscopy, everything. So if you ever have a chance to look at an MW, Mark Wainwright MWAC at UNSW. And the director of that center till about a year ago was where is the okay. Mark Wainwright, analytical center. The director of that center till about a year or two ago was Dr. Graini Moran. And she's originally from UK. And I think she's from Ireland. It was very good work, working with her. And it was also a pleasure to have her name as the as a co-supervisor of all my PhD students. All right. And when we wrote a paper, she's so critical. It would take we we had to send it to her from the, for those parts at least four or five times. But I liked it that way. All right. But whenever she passed through through close my office, she always used to come down and say, "Hello, Bando, how are you?" The common grinding. This is XRD spectra fly ash. You have intensity versus two theta. All right, and then so these are the these are quite common things. So you get the peaks that reflect the kind of crystallinity. Q stands for quartz and M, M for malite. They are the components of the fly ash. So you can get all these peaks, and these peaks actually identify the materials present there. So if you have sharp peaks, that shows crystallinity. And if you have not sharp peaks, but if you have things like that, that shows amorphous material. So if you do the same thing for polyethylene or polypropylene, you'll have large 
thing like that and then it will go up. The sharp peak is the crystal area. So depending on the area under that and the area under the sharp peak, you can work out what is the extent of degree of crystallinity or what is the degree of amorphousness. All right. Any question on this? Is are everyone of you are are familiar with this? If not, when when see your colleagues or their scholars or uh, thinking they are working there, just sometimes go and see, see these things when they do it. Okay. When I did my MTech in IIT Kanpur, one session there is Dr. C. N. Rao was in charge in the chemistry part of, of that course. I did all the experiments, but there was one day there was I was supposed to go to a lab in IR spectroscopy. At that time there was no FTIR, only IR spectroscopy. Somehow or other I was not well or I missed that lab. And then I really realized that I missed it so much. Then fortunately when DSTO gave me a position in chemistry department, then I got back all those things. And now I realize how good IR spectroscopy is and FTIR. Okay, so it's fantastic. But I felt so sorry that I had missed that lab. So never miss any lab. And even if you get a chance when someone else is doing a lab, just take a cup of tea. Pretend that you are a top boss and go and see and learn, all right? Because there is nothing left that we cannot learn. What is composition of malite? Empirical formula of malite is given by that Al2 plus 2x, Al2 plus 2x. Silica 2 minus 2x, oxygen 10 minus 1. So, x is the oxygen vacancy in the crystal and it ranges between 0 to 1. So, this is something which I was so impressed when Dr. Dilip Devnath was doing it. And because this came from his PhD background in Japan, okay. He was originally, he, he is and was originally from Bangladesh, but he went to Japan and do his PhD. And when x is 0, the composition is Composition is 1 to 1 of L2O3 and CiO2. And also there is no siliminite in the fly, not in fly ash if X is 0. Malite is 3 by 2 or 2 over 1 ratio of Al2O3, SiO2. Now in the green one, here it says, what is bonding shape of silicon oxide aluminum and defect in unit cell configuration? Tetrahedral or octahedral, occupancy number of each element, and then he said, okay, you can go back to that publication, and that gives you these details. So, this is informative, and I didn't want to go into too much inside all this chemistry, but these references are there. Do you, will you have access to all these slides? Through Professor Kaur. Yesterday I received an email requesting me to send the slides. Who sent me the email? Veera. Is there any Veera here? Dr. Veera Sudha? Maybe not yet. Okay. But, but the lady did not put her affiliation. So I thought she may be from here or maybe. She may have been watching it on TV, on, online or things like that. But <coughs> as I wanted to send her an email saying that, please give your affiliation so that I, I may not forget it. But then my computer said, no, you cannot send email from here. I said, all right, that's good. So <coughs> just going back to that <coughs> semiconducting thing, this, like my present researcher, who has been working on the semiconducting properties, no, dielectric, pro dielectric properties of fly ash epoxy composites, he found, he's found that those two composites, which have the highest value of 
real and imaginary parts of the Dalek constant, both of them seem to show no presence of malite. So, that was something interesting and I, I keep on thinking about it, what to do and you know, things like that. So, presence of malite, till that information I did not think much of malite. I thought it's just part of everything, but then when we did that and showed that those two comp those two compositions, which have highest real and highest imaginary dialect constants, they did not have any, did not show any malite on the X-ray diffraction pattern. So those few information of those, those few graphs, particularly the x-ray, they are very interesting. You, you, you can see the particle size distribution and x-ray is the one where you can actually identify the things. And also, if you have those particles, you are looking at the electron microscope, there is inbuilt x-ray diffraction technique in many electron microscope. Is that right? So, you can do that x-ray and also FTIR and things like that. So, electron microscopes can combine those things. So, that you can see the very small particles and then you said, okay, XRD you move away. So, the, the other thing comes in. So, you can actually identify those things. So, that is the best thing of these analytical, analytical laboratories. So, mechanical properties of composites is that is what is important when you are working on the, on those things on the material load bearing or load transferring so normally when people do the strength of the composite they do it room temperature and it is quite all right but this Dr. Dilip Devnath, he's such a st strong guy. He said, "Sir, 20 degrees centigrade is a common temperature somewhere. Look, but some places may have temperature of 50 degree. Why do we get 50 degrees C temperature in Kanpur? Do we get close to 50 in summer? And is there any place where you can get close to 70 degree in summer? No. But then he said." When you are going to 70 degree, you are going the polypropylene, not the fly, the polypropylene itself can start softening. So, stress and relationships of polypropylene fly ash. So, the top one is 0 percent fly ash, 20 percent fly ash here, and it shows that. You have to please take a note of the y axis that is telling you what is the limit. So, they all look like the same height, but here this is this is if you are going there that is about 33 MPA. Here if you are going like that that is come down to about 17 MPA. So, here if you are like that that is about 12 or 13. So, although the graphs look of the same height, but the scale makes a change. Now, sometimes it is worthwhile you can keep the same scale, then these graphs are like that and the other graphs will come down. So you can do it that way also. Or for us the best way is to do both. You have one set, but the scales are the same. Because different people have different quickness of vision. So, this is 25 degree, this is 50 degree and this is 70 degree. So these tests are done in Instron. And lot of instruments have this attachment. So, you can actually put the things and there is a small furnace. You have instruments like that with temperature facilities. Maybe go back and get something like that. All right? Because particularly if you are working with flyers and polymers, ceramics, they said we do not care. Ceramics are very high. But still, if you are working in the area of this nuclear energy, 
then a difference between 1000 degrees C and 1200 degrees C makes a difference. So, you, you may need to have facilities which are there. And fortunately, we have a Australian nuclear science organization which is close to, which is in, in a suburb of Sydney. And when I did some of my earlier work, so I had interaction with the in charge there and they did all the things. So that was excellent. And again, I took their permission to include their names in the publications. So facilities are existing anywhere and everywhere. Look around and they will be happy to work with you. But once you work with them, please give them a share of your achievements because they have this give you time and they give you money and they spend money and they give you their things. All right. Now, coming back to this, when Professor Kaur presented his stress strain diagrams the other day, so he explained things like that. But I suggested to Dr. Dilipna that when you put these stress strain diagrams, it's good, but what does it mean to the specimens? I suggested you please include the specimen so that when it goes, particularly when you are presenting in America and things like that, they're very, their eyes are very microscopic. So I said, please put those things. So this is the scale, but and also I said here, put a scale. Always do that. So this is the normal HTMD 68 tensile specimen. This is when it is in the central part it's becoming like fibrillating, it's getting fibrillating. And it's not yet broken, so it is somewhere around, at, beyond this po point is broken. But here when it's yielding, it is showing fibrillation. And some of the fibers, that means this one has much less extension, but this one is actually is having extension, keeping on increasing, increasing, increasing. So that has not yet fibrillated and not yet failed, okay? So that gives an indication of how things look like. So this is quickly when something is happening, maybe somewhere around there with 60 percent fly ash or 45 percent fly ash. And without the fly ash, it keeps on going up like that. Storage modulus with temperatures of composites. Storage modulus is when if you are in, in polymers, then you have storage modulus and what is the other alternative thing? Loss modulus. It's a fantastic thing. So, you store something and you lose something. So, that the storage modulus is the positive and the loss modulus is the negative. So, if you are if you are spending lots of things, you are having high loss modulus. And if you are putting lot of, gaining lot of things, is high storage modulus. But, I am Ward, Professor Ian Ward, I think, so he was from University of Leeds, I think he is there or may have transferred. He has a book on mechanical properties of polymers. I am what he explains this loss modulus and storage modulus very well. So if you I am what Professor I am what this is on email. I'm told that you can see everything, okay? That's good. If you go to Professor I.M. Ward and Mechanical Properties of Polymer, you can see that book reference and you can actually have it. And it explains all these things so well. And then you can measure the storage modulus as a function of temperature. So normally, 
we have zero fly ash, I want to click the wrong button. If you have zero fly ash, this is the one at room temperature, you have a modulus of about storage module about 1.3 GPA and at room temperature 30 degrees C with 60 percent fly ash that modulus has gone up to about 2.5 GPA. So, the what is modulus? Modulus is the rigidity. Say for example, if I sit down on this chair, it does not go very much down. So, it has reasonable modulus, but if you sit on a chair which has a rubber seat, then half of you will go down. So, the deformation will be very high. So, if you have a high modulus, then the deformation is much less. All right? So, modulus is very important. Now, normally ceramics have high modulus. So, if you are, if you want to, if you are, when you are flying in a plane, you are all sitting down there, the plane has about 250 tons to weight. It used to be, so when I was told when I was flying from Sydney to Singapore, they said, including oil, fuel, passengers and everything, it weighs about 250 tons. And by the time it reaches Singapore, it, the fuel goes out, so the weight becomes about 150 tons or something like that. Okay? But when you are sitting there, it is important for it to have very high storage modulus, but at this time much less weight. That's why steel has high storage modulus, much high, but steel also has very high density. So that's why you go for composite materials. Carbon fiber is so low density and so high modulus. So those are the things in composite materials. Even if you are using fly ash in polypropylene, so that means you are trying to use polypropylene, but polypropylene has much lower modulus, so you can put fly ash. Even if you can double the modulus, then you can reduce the weight by about 50 percent. All right. So this one, this pink one shows. I think. So here it's about 100 percent improvement. So this gives you the actual benefit. Whereas the strength was showing coming down and things like that, but that could be because of the stress concentration, but modulus is a much better thing. All right. Any question on this graph? So, with 20 percent fly ash, the modulus is going up by very little. With 45, it's going up good and 60. And if, if you go up to 80 percent paracetamol, it might go up even there, 3 GPA. So, 3 GPA, can you think, of, tell me, a plastic polymer which has modulus of elasticity of 3 GPA? Epoxy. Epoxy is a thermosetting polymer. It can have modulus of elasticity between 2.5 to 3 GPA, whereas polyethylene has less than 1 GPA. Okay? not G, polyethylene has much less than 1 GPA. So, this is about, this is 1 GPA, this is 2 GPA, this is 3 GPA. What is GPA? What does G stands for? Gigapascal. I can see a lot of you are f falling asleep because it's, it's too much fly ash or too much composites coming up in the lecture, or I too much. But this is what is a microscopic aspects which affects or influences the macroscopic aspects. All right. So that is why it is important to know this. Like yes. Yes, yes, yes. No, normally, it's done on the basis of the tensile strength, but without any crack or things like that. 
But if, if you put a crack or a notch, then it becomes a notch effect. But this is done from the tensile strength. And tensile strength in the early part, in the early part of the stress tension diagram. Elastic early part. And sometimes when you do that, it may come up like that. So you ignore this part, the early part of the elastic line. Because that's when voids and things are not happening there. The more you go up, the voice may start come up. That was a very good question. Thank you. Morphology and interfacial interaction. That means morphology of the particles and how it affects. SEM images of fracture surfaces. Now, when you have seen one of the pictures where the fibers, the, the polymers are actually getting into fibrillar part and eventually when it fractures. So this is net polypropylene. On the left hand side we have 25 percent and on the right hand side is 70 percent. What is the difference between these two fracture surfaces? This is the scaling electron microscopy. What, what is the difference between the left hand side and the right hand side? Yes. Thank you. Because at, at 70 degrees centigrade, the, you have the temperature, going up, so the material becomes much soft. So that is ductile. So what is the advantage of ductile fracture over brittle fracture? It shows plastic deformation, absorbs more energy and also it gives you much more time. If something happens, brittle fracture does not give you the time. If there is ductile fracture, at least you have some time you can take, you can take some action. You can run out or if you are in a plane, plane is where the pilot gets some time to, all right? Or if the two train collides, if it's made of ductile materials, then the material will take up the energy and deform before the, it comes onto the human bodies and things like that. So ductile fracture is much safe. Now, sometimes it might look a bit funny because it is not, but ductility is important. All right? So this is neat. This is neat polypropylene, and this is neat this at 70. And then if you have 60 percent fly ash in polypropylene, this is at 25 and this is at 75. Not 75, 25 and 70. So here you have the fly ash, they are like particles, but the fly ash particles are also still like that. They are taking the strength and giving the high energy, but you still have ductile failure. So 60 percent fly ash, it at room temperature it gives you the double the storage modulus and when you are looking at the fracture here and also please see that the scale bar is the same, almost the same 10 microns and that is what I always like to see for myself. If you have, if you are comparing electron microscopy thing, Please always use the same scale bar. You can go to different scale bars, sets of scale bars, but when you are comparing a few elements, so yes. But if you want to look at it still higher magnification, then take all these photos at higher magnification, but please compare them at the same thing. Otherwise, they can give you wrong information. So these are the fracture studies. How does the fracture studies? That means you do the tensile strength and they eventually came out and then they we have the separate parts. Now, these are the parameters and this will be very useful things. Hukansky model, Ziegel, Romanov model and they are, sorry, sorry you are taking photographs, okay. 
So, this shows inter interfacial parameter and this is at 25 degrees C with flash content it does not change much, but it at least does not go down. If you have 60 degree or 20 degree that part is constant, but if you go to the other things with flash content at high temperature, originally with lower percentages like that and then it starts coming down with fly ash. And the other model gives you this kind of thing and you can work out equation from there. Often when you have graphs and publish, people leave them with graphs like that. But I, I hassle myself a bit more. I said, hang on, find out the equation there and then find out the parabolic and here is the straight line and here is the parabolic equation. And these days, computer said, all right, Dr. Bando, if you are so fussy, we, we give you some programs, just put them like that. In early days, we had to work out all these equations ourselves. That was funny thing, but it was very interesting. And when I couldn't do it in DSTO, there were some clever people I said, hey, can you please do this? They said, we'll do that, but you have to bring us some good food. I said, okay. So I used to bring good food to them. I said, sit down, eat them. All right? Because that's energy. What is food? Food is energy. And if you have energy, you can work further. So, these are something where you go from the all these properties, tensile properties, structure properties, and then you go to the allness and you go to the X-ray, and then you, are, you, you go to these models, this. So, they make things important. And from there, following Langmuir model, you can actually, this is the flash and this is the polymer. All right, the flash has silicon oxide and you have the polymer. And that is how it is going. And the binding energy at electron volt it goes up like that. XPS, this is flash spectra. And so that is something. So this this is the this is relates to the flyers that way. Silicon oxide and all these things. And that shows that that interacts with the polymer. Polymer has carbon, hydrogen, sometimes oxygen bond, and that actually. So now going back to what Professor Kamalkar was saying yesterday that if you put a carbon coating there, the body likes it. Now, now that the polymer has carbon and hydrogen and if you are putting silicon oxide, okay, silicon and sil silicon, so hydrogen and carbon, both of them like oxygen. So, both of them go in favor of that. But the silicon does not release the oxygen. The silicon said, okay, if you have to take my oxygen, you have to take me. Because I'll look after the oxygen. So, that's how. So, yesterday, what Professor Kamalkar was saying, that was so interesting. You have the oxygen, like in the, in the polymer, you give a carbon coating. Carbon coating is there. But the rest of it is worked together. Okay? It's like, we are all people from different background, like Professor Kamalko said yesterday, looks like a khichuri, but I disagreed with that. I didn't say anything. Khichuri has chawal, dal and all these things together, and it also has a similar, uh, similar components as you have in vegetables and other things. So, khichuri is a fantastic thing. Sometimes the best food is khichuri. You can taste everything together. But I didn't say that to Professor Kamalkar, okay? If it, because when my wife said, what do you want to eat? This says, and I said, then she doesn't say anything, and then she brings something, I say, this is khichuri. And I love it, okay? So, this shows how silicon is there, the oxygen is there, and the hydrogen is trying to go there, carbon is trying to go there. So, that's how 
Here the hydrogen is going oxygen. So that is fantastic. And that, that big silicon, silicon oxide comes from that XRD, because that XRD confirms that it is silicon. All right? So, I think we will stop for some time and we will go to this second, this it will continue, but my request is please interact with the things and like analytical center and if you have places in your universities, you can try to form an analytical center which belongs not a part of a department, because if you grow in part of department, people are too bossy at times and that is what I do not feel like myself. I think I am a very ordinary person, and it's all, all these equipment and things, they are the boss. So, if you have the access to the boss, so please try to set up in each of your centers, a center which is freely available to everyone. They may put a charge like that, it's, that's fair enough, because you have to get qualified people, so you have to pay things, okay. So, that kind of thing, and MWAC, which I put, put up there, Mark, and Mark Wainwright, okay, I must mention that. He, he was a profile chancellor, he is a professor of mechanical engineering. And remember the other day I said that when one of my journal papers came out on glass fiber reinforced composites showing that if you have similar volume fraction of fiber but with different types of fabrics and then some of them much higher strength and safety than uh, Boeing from USA headquarters, they wrote, wrote to me, they said, can we use your technology? And then I sent it off. I did not send it off to my head of school because head of schools have a different background. But I sent it off to Professor Mark Wendert because he is a mechanical engineer. So I thought he will be even much better person than even me because I am not, not a mechanical engineer. And then Mark Wendert was, he said, Yes, Bando, tell them. And then after about 14 years or so, or 12, 13, 14 years, so, when Boeing has implemented that technology in their this aircraft 787 and things like that. So, that is why I have a lot of respect for Mark Wainwright. And also when I used to keep him informed. So, when I was visiting scientists at JNU, New Delhi, you are familiar with JNU? Yeah, John Lennon uh, School of Physics. And then one day I was giving a chance to talk to the Vice Chancellor and then I spoke with him about Nano Center. And within half an hour, we were informed that JNU was going to set up a nano center under the uh, all this India government project. So, this is how having an analytical center or things like that brings together all the technology and that is what you can see here on the on the left hand side if you have the you have the micro atomic or molecular structure and on the right hand side you have the XRD and so if you have to go to two different places or two different institutions, it may be time consuming, but if you have all the facilities in the same place, then you can actually learn more. And then you can also interact with the scientists in both the places. And finally, make sure you make them part of your publications, because then you will have a bond and they will learn also. Okay. Can I give it a break?